So really quick, do you guys remember this? Come on, cheer them on! Did you rip the whole cover in half? Let's see if you can do that. Can you rip it in half? No, like open, open it up, open up. Give him a round of applause. Okay, so yeah, you remember that. I've used that in two or three videos now. And I had a subscriber to Nathan Roberts, Dean Odell's Celebrate Truth, uh, and I guess probably now Nate Wolf's channel. Um, he sent me a message, or it could have been a she. Got the vibe it was a he, though. But this person sent me a message and said, oh, it's completely scriptural to rip up books. And this person gave me a scriptural reference, which was completely wrong, by the way. They were 14 chapters off. It's actually in Acts 19. It isn't. Uh, in Acts 5. But I thought, you know, I'm going to take the time and I'm going to show people how there's way more happening in the Bible, way more happening in the biblical text than most people realize. So we're going to look at the incident in Acts 19 where there were a whole bunch of scrolls and text ripped up and destroyed because that did happen. And we're going to look at what happened and why it happened. The power of your God is a cheap magician's trick. Join us. Okay, fast forward to Acts 19. The setting is Paul and Ephesus. So this is the city of Ephesus, ancient city, biblical city. And here's what happened. So Acts 19, verse 11, it says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles. And I've mentioned this in other videos, that even if you were to go to a seminary or a theological institute, the Acts is always referred to as short for Acts of the Apostles. But it isn't Acts of the Apostles. It's Acts of the Holy Spirit. See, here you see in verse 11, it doesn't say the Apostles were doing extraordinary miracles. It says, and God, the Spirit, the person of God, was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin, they were carried away and given to the sick. And when they were laid on the sick, their diseases left them, and if there were any evil spirits in them, they came out of them. Then it goes on and says in verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus also over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. It goes on and says in verse 14, seven sons of a certain Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered these young men, and this evil demonic entity said, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And it goes on in verse 16 and says, And the man in whom the evil spirit was, it leaped on them. So it jumped out of this man that it had inhabited, and it jumped on these sons of this Jewish exorcist. And this demon, this evil spirit, it mastered all of them, overpowering them, so that they fled out of that house naked and basically beat the crap out of, naked and wounded. In verse 17, it says, And all of this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both the Jews and the Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was exalted. Also, many of those who were now believers, those who had come to Christ, they came, confessing and divulging their practices. And also, many of those, now really follow this closely, in verse 18, it says, Also, many of those who are now believers came. Well, it's going to tell you who those were. Now they're believers. Now they're confessing and divulging their hidden practices. They were sorcerers. When they saw all this happen, great fear of the Lord came upon them, and they realized that the name by which Paul had authority and dominion over the spirits which they had been soliciting, that they answered to Paul by this name of Jesus. So suddenly they became believers really quick upon Jesus Christ. And I'm sure there was probably some preaching involved in that as well. But it says these sorcerers, who were now believers, believers on Christ, they came and they begin confessing and divulging their practices of sorcery. Then it goes on in 19 and says, And a number of those, again, who's those? These sorcerers and witches and people that were practicing divination and hidden magic, hidden arts, not all of them, but those who were now believers on Christ, 
who had been practicing magic arts, they brought their books together and burned them, and they burned them in the sight of all. And they estimated the value of all these books, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the reason why they had brought these scrolls is because all these scrolls and books, they contained incantations and formulas for basically making deals with demons. That's really all magic is. Magic is just the worship of and soliciting of demonic spirits and even possibly fallen principal angels. Magic is just a person who was soliciting the help from the unseen realm, the hidden realm, the spirit realm. It's soliciting help from demons. That's what magic is. And these books that they brought, these books were not fictional books, okay? This wasn't Plato. This wasn't Aristotle. Um, you know, this wasn't Aristophanes talking about the, the earth being round. This wasn't Aristarchus talking about the sun, uh, the planets going around the sun. They brought books in scrolls that contained incantations and basically prescripted transactions where they could solicit help from demons. Okay, now I'm going to show you a picture. This is Artemis. This is a Greek goddess. Her name is Artemis. And for many, 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 many years, it was suggested uh, at different times that this was a fertility motif. It was suggested that those were just multiple breasts. You know, sometimes gods, they have multiple heads, they have multiple arms. A lot of Indian gods, goddesses have multiple arms and legs. So it was suggested that possibly these are just multiple breasts. It was even suggested by some scholars that this could even represent testicles, as some goddesses and gods uh, had a transgender element. The idea of transgenderism is not new. It's actually ancient, very old. But that isn't the point. And now we know these are what are called corsia. And these are goat skin leather hide pouches that contain fetish objects which are used in magic and rituals. Um, a fetish object is just an object that's used in magic where you attribute some kind of power or religious motif to whatever that object is. It's a religious, ritualistic item. And oddly enough, on a side note, Korsha, the use of Korsha, can be traced all the way back to the Hittites. So that's kind of interesting. And even all the way back to the Hittite use of these, the bags were filled with fetish objects that were used to invoke demonic spirits for use of protection in many things. Many uses they had for making transactions with demonic spirits to perform tasks on their behalf. Okay, let's go back to Acts 19 real quick. Again, the setting is Ephesus. Uh, all throughout the Roman Empire, there were places where um, goddesses and gods were revered, and magic was pretty, uh, it was pretty prevalent. But Ephesus had a singular distinction as having a reputation as a city that was really steeped in superstition and magic, and had a reputation for the use of incantations and, and magical spells. If you look here, and a really good example here, uh, in some translations, when you get down to verse 19 in Acts 19, verse 19, uh, it'll say that, you know, a number who had become Christians, a number of people who had been born again and believed on Christ, who had previously practiced sorcery, it says they brought their scrolls. Some translations, it says books. And then you see with this place where it says, and when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And you're sitting here thinking, how in the world, how in the world do all these scrolls uh, add up to that much money? Well, you're not just talking about the scrolls because uh, this is actually referring to what scholars call the Ephesian letters. And Ephesian letters, I'm not talking about uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. I'm talking about pagan material. What is known uh, to scholars as the Ephesian letters, they were little incantations that were written and combined with fetish objects and were put in these uh, in the Korsha that were hung or stuck to Artemis. They were basically attached or hung or draped to Artemis. These Ephesian letters were little scraps of, um, uh, you know, we would call it paper, uh, but it was just little scraps of, of probably um, some kind of animal skin. And incantations, words used for sorcery and incantations, divination, it would be placed 
in the Kershia, and they would be hung around or attached somehow to Artemis. So when it says that they came and they destroyed the scrolls, uh, they're not just talking about the scrolls and the Kershia, they're actually talking about the whole thing. They're talking about Artemis, the statue, which represented this pagan goddess, and the scrolls which were attached to her. And we see down later, if, if you keep reading, there was a riot, because it led to the silversmiths who made the silver shrines of Artemis. They had a really good business going, making these shrines that people would attach their cursia to that contained their fetish objects and these little scrolls, what they call the Ephesian letters, that they would use for magic. And there was one certain silversmith named Demetrius, and in 25, verse 25, again, Acts uh, 19, he called all his business guys together, and he called his business partners, he called workers and also in people in related trays, and said, you know, we're making a really good living doing this. And now we've got this guy named Paul, who was convinced and led astray numbers of people here in Ephesus. Notice they're saying, you know, Paul's getting people born again, but the silversmith, he's saying, oh, well, Paul's leading people astray. Does that kind of thing sound familiar? You know, you got this guy, it's not that Paul's leading people astray, it's just that what he's doing, Paul's getting people born again, saved, Fill with the spirit, but it's hurting this guy's business because he's not selling as many Artemis shrines as he was before. It kind of goes back to that money thing, doesn't it? Somebody hurts your pocketbook, you just call him demon possessed. Mm hmm. But Demetrius goes on and says, Look, Paul's leading all these people astray here in Ephesus, and in practically the whole province of Asia. See, the word of God was spreading. The word of God was spreading. The gospel was spreading. People were responding, and they were giving up their gods and their goddesses and their magic. And Demetrius accuses Paul of saying, look, uh, Paul's saying that gods are made by human hands, and that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. And of course, that's, you know, that's what he's doing. He's making images of a goddess. And so he's saying, look, Paul's saying that these aren't even really gods or goddesses goddesses, this is hurting our business. So Demetrius continues on in verse 27 and says, look, there's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. Now, how much do you think he cared about that? No, he's just trying to get more allies. He's manipulating people. That sounds kind of familiar too, doesn't it? But he says, there's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who was worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the whole world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. See, he's not just trying to rile up his, his fellow people in the silver trade. He's trying to rile up everybody. He's trying to get everyone riled up against Paul. And in 28, it obviously worked because when they heard that, they got really angry and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Are you sure this guy didn't have a flat earth YouTube channel? Sure to sound like... Okay, so in verse 29 it says... Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. Paul was like, this is, a, this is an opportunity to preach the gospel. When Paul saw crowds of people, he just thought, I'm going to preach Jesus to these guys. So Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but Paul's disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province, people that were friends of Paul. So evidently there were some uh, people uh, in their government that liked Paul. And they told Paul, it's like, look, man, uh, please don't go into the theater. They're going to rip you apart if you go in there. And so in verse 32, it says the assembly was in confusion. That sounds really familiar, too. And it continues on, and, and Luke says, some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. That's what happens when you just get people riled up. So Some people just, just want to be riled up. They like being riled up. The easiest thing to do is to get people in rebellion and anger. Easiest thing in the world to do. And they don't even know why they're angry or they don't even know what's going on. And soon, and before you know it, soon they're involved in a cult. But what's happening here is uh, there were some Jews there and the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions to him. And Alexander motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized that he was not a Greek but a Jew, they all shouted in unison for a about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. How many of you think there was probably a demonic influence happening here? I, I tend to think there probably was. 
And then in verse 35, it says, The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Look, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image which fell from heaven? Because that's what they believed. And in 36, it says, Therefore, since these facts are they're undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If they feel like Paul and his uh, his disciples, if they have robbed you or done wrong to you, then uh, come and press charges. Then in verse 39, it says, if there's anything further you want to bring up, it has to be settled in a legal assembly. In other words, not a mob. Verse 40, it goes on and says, as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the people. So what you're really looking at, uh, these weren't people uh, that were ripping up books, uh, tearing up books. They weren't ripping up scrolls. What they were doing is they were destroying images of Artemis along with the Kershaw that was attached. As you can see in the picture, it's a representation of what they would do. The little sacks would have fetish objects and little pieces of paper, which scholars call Ephesian letters, that contain incantations, and they would solicit demons to do something, to, to perform a task, protection. Um, maybe somebody wanted someone to fall in love with them. As anything you could think of, there was there was a magic ritual, again, to solicit a transaction between you and one or more uh, entities. And so they weren't just ripping up books. And here's another thing to notice. When these people brought out their Artemis images with the Kershia attached, with their spells attached, and these little goat skin pouches, they did not destroy those images and those magic incantations, the magic material, the fetish objects, because they heard the earth was flat. No, these were people that had been practicing magic. They were sorcerers. These were people that had been brought up in the ways of sorcery, divination, and magic. These were people that were neck deep in the occult and dealings with evil demonic spirits. These were not people that heard the earth was flat and said, man, we need to rip up our Aristophanes books. We need to rip up our Aristarchus books. We need to rip up Plato. We need to have a book burning. That's not what was happening. These sorcerers, these diviners, they had seen demons cast out. They had seen the authority of the kingdom of God in action. They had seen demons driven out by the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. And as a result of that, and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, nothing else but hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only preached, but demonstrated. They weren't just hearing the gospel, they weren't just hearing about the kingdom, but they were seeing, they were seeing the power of God and the kingdom of God in action before their eyes. And because of that, they went and got their Artemis images with their Kershia attached, their magic incantations, and they destroyed them. They burned them. If you don't know what you're looking at, you know, it's, it's, it costs 50,000, you know, a drachma, and you're thinking, man, what did they do? Did they empty out a library? No. It's more going on here. That's what I'm saying, man. There's more happening in your biblical text than what you're getting in your Sunday school bumper sticker reading. There's more happening. That's all you have to study to show yourself approved. They weren't burning books. This wasn't a book burning. These were sorcerers that were burning basically their demonic Bibles. That's basically what it is. Burning their incantations, their goddess, the image of their goddess, their transactions with devils. That's basically what was contained in, in the Kershaw, in the little goatskin pouches. That's what's attached there again to Artemis. They were destroying the image of Artemis and the Kershaw, and you see down further proof of that because the silversmiths started a riot against Paul and the disciples, Paul's disciples. So this... Did you rip the whole cover in half? Let's see if you can do that. Can you rip it in half? No, like open, open it up. Open up. It's not this. You know, they weren't tearing up fictional tales. They weren't ripping up at the Epic of Gilgamesh. They weren't destroying uh, things like that. They were basically repenting 
of their occult practices. These people were making deals, transactions, soliciting the assistance of demons. That's what they were doing. And they were bringing their images of Artemis, and they were bringing their incantations attached to her. Again, that's what that's what those little bulbous things are, the Kershia. They were bringing those things and destroying all of it and giving their life to Christ. Not to cosmology and not to flat earth. And one last thing I want to add to that is, you know, Paul again made it very clear that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against hidden and visible spiritual powers principalities, which again are just falling entities. They're fallen angelic beings. Okay, so um, I guess I guess by this demonstration we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against paper and ink. You know, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're, you know, we're wrestling against paper. We're wrestling against uh, uh, books, evidently. You know, the thing you want to teach your children, this is what you want to teach your children. You want to teach your children how to worship the Father in heaven. That's the thing you want to teach your children. You want to teach your children who, who, who their heavenly Father is. You want to teach your children how to be spiritual giants and lights in the world that is falling apart and shrouded in darkness. That's what you teach your children. You do that by giving them spiritual principles that they can use. Ripping up a book, that's not going to help them. When Satan attacks their marriage, they're not going to be able to rip up a book. When Satan attacks their body with disease, they're not going to be able to deal with that by ripping up a book. When Satan attacks their mind with depression, they're not going to be able to rip up a book. You cannot answer real spiritual darkness with ripping up Star Wars books. Okay? That's not going to work. That's not going to work. You teach your children how to be sons and daughters of the Most High God, of their Father in Heaven. That's what you teach them. You teach your children how to put on the full armor of God. We don't combat the fiery darts of the enemy by ripping up books. That's not how we do that. We combat fiery darts of the enemy by having the armor of God, by having the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the Spirit. That's how we combat darkness. That's how we combat things that are not of God, not by ripping up Star Wars books. Did you rip the whole cover in half? Let's see if you can do that. Can you rip it in half? No, like open, open it up. Open up.